Thank you, Lydia, and, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I really can't express how much I'm geeking out uh, about being part of this celebration. Um, in fact, let me do a quick check here. Uh, yep, the Linpack benchmark on my phone tells me that I have 6.26 gigaflops. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> And you know when when uh, it was announced that uh, Jack Dungar was receiving the Turing Prize, it, it immediately for me brings back personal memories because the tools that Jack has developed touch us all who do scientific compute. Uh, and and my work has really been in computational physics and engineering. And so IcePack, LinPack, NetLib, um, LAPack, um, the Blas, these are the tools. Uh, that I've used in my career. These are the tools that my students have used. Uh, and so this is a very uh, a very direct and meaningful connection for me. Um, the provost is not supposed to geek out uh, about computational linear algebra, but I did bring a, a bona fide as an engineer. I got a pen stuck in my pocket. <laughs> but there's no protector, so I'm not quite there. Um, but in any event, I'm really thrilled that one of UNM's own, a, a proud Lobo, has been recognized for his amazing achievements in work in numerical linear algebra and in, um, uh, in scientific computing. I do want to make one comment about the, uh, so the ACM description of, of Jack's work. It's a long description. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I loved this part. Um, uh, a major contribution in creating open source software libraries and standards which employ linear algebra as an intermediate language that can be used by a wide variety of applications. Oh, well, it's technically true, but it's just not a way I thought of linear algebra <laughs> as, as an intermediate language. Uh, but it is, it is from the Association of Computing Machinery, and so we can understand why it's described in that way. <laughs> But again, really a proud testament, I think, to the education that UNM can provide, uh, to the, uh, the mentorship that can occur here in Albuquerque at UNM. And, and so we're very proud of Jack's accomplishment uh, in receiving this recognition from the ACM. To introduce Jack, I would like to introduce Cleve Muller. Uh, Cleve is uh, was, uh, uh, Jack Dengar's uh, PhD advisor when he was in school here uh, at uh, UNM. Uh, many of you know Cleve as the creator of MATLAB, a tool that also many of us have used that he started the creation of right here in Albuquerque at UNM. Uh, and so we're really excited to turn the microphone over to Cleve to introduce Jack. Jack, he was just a kid then. I still think he was, think he was a kid. Uh, and uh, through through our connections of Archon, uh, he came out here to Los Alamos and got his PhD here in applied math from, from UNM. Uh, and then I've seen Jack grow. Uh, it's really been I'm really proud of Jack. It couldn't happen to a nicer guy. He's a he's a genuine, personable family man. How many grandkids are there? Eight. Eight grandkids. So uh, lots of things to admire about Jack. Uh, I've been, Jack, thanks for being my student and uh, welcome. To, oh, well, by the way, the Turing Award. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's a big. 
deal too because <laughs> the ACM has has given the award to uh, people who I, I throw throw away line and we do we use computers for what God intended them to do arithmetic. <laughs> so uh, Jack, congratulations on the Turing Award and welcome back to you and Well, it's, uh, it's quite a pleasure to be back here. I'm honored to be back here at UNM. It's been, uh, let's see, I, was, um, I received my PhD in, in, in uh, well, 42 years ago. So it's been a long time since I was a student here. Things have changed considerably uh, in that time, of course. Uh, it's hard to recognize uh, places. The, the names are the same in some cases, but the buildings have completely changed, as in Ferris, uh, Ferris Hall. Um, uh, the math is, is, of course, moved from where it was when I was here but it looks like a very nice, uh, nice facility. So it's, it's a pleasure to be back. Some things remain the same. Uh, the Frontier Restaurant hasn't changed, of course. <laughs> and um, uh, you know, many, many things are, are like that. It's beautiful. Uh, this morning we watched the balloons ascend uh, from, uh, from a distance, and that, that was very nice to see as well. So um, a pleasure to be back. Um, how are we doing in terms of getting the slides up? Oh, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right, so. Um, Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes and I'm done. That's right. Thank you so much for attending my talk. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So all of that was to get my laser pointer right working. So um, I'm going to talk about some software that's been developed over the last uh, 40, 50 years. Um, I'm at the University of Tennessee. I'm emeritus professor now at the University of Tennessee. I hold an appointment at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, about 40 miles from campus. And uh, I also have an appointment at the University of Manchester in the UK, about 4,000 miles. Uh, from campus. I don't go there every day, and uh, uh, I go there in the summers usually. Okay, I want to tell you a story. I haven't told many people this story. So, um, um, my family uh, comes from uh, Sicily. So, my grandparents were born in Sicily. My father uh, was born there. So, my, my grandparents come from two small villages in the center of uh, Sicily. And it's a mountainous, it's uh, rocky, and there's a sense of isolation. I was there a number of years ago to visit the, the homeland, and it was uh, quite interesting. My grandfather worked in a sulfur mine, if you will, in Sicily. And uh, you know, he wanted a better way. He was looking for um, uh, to come to America. So he was 42 years old when he got on a boat. He uh, sailed to Ellis Island in 1929. He had $25 in his pocket um, with hopes of a new life. My father. Um, was with, uh, with him, and he was 10 years old at that time when he came here. This is his uh, immigration card. It's my father's uh, immigration card uh, from the boat. This is his, uh, his vaccination um, uh, shot, his vaccination proof. It looks like he got upgraded. So he was in third class, and he got upgraded to second class economy. So that was a good sign, I guess. <laughs> and that was the boat that, that brought him over. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of my history. My parents. Um, they grew up uh, in Chicago in the Italian neighborhood. They didn't attend high school. Um, uh, they did have an understanding of the importance of education, and uh, they knew about hard work, and they instilled it in myself and my brothers. Um, I had a hard time in school, I have to say. I struggled uh, with uh, reading and spelling. I was pretty good in math and science, and it turns out I have dyslexia. So, as many people do, uh, you know, that, that was my uh, problem. I wanted to be a high school science teacher. So I took courses at the place where most of the uh, teachers in the Chicago Public School are, are um, produced. And um, uh, I, I was there and, and worked through that. And again, I was pretty good in science. Uh, my physics professor said I should, in my last semester at, at, uh, at, the, at Chicago State University, he said I should apply to a program at Argonne National Laboratory. So it was in Chicago, Argonne's in the suburbs of Chicago. He said, um, it's a program where you spend a semester with a scientist. So I applied for this program, and I was selected. And uh, I went to Argonne. Uh, so Argonne, as I think Cleve mentioned, is an open science lab like Lawrence Berkeley and Oak Ridge. Um, uh, it's run by the Department of Energy. And I worked for this guy. So this is Brian Smith. I worked for him as a, as a undergraduate uh, doing things. Pardon? He's, he's right there. No, he's right there. He's right there. That's right. That's right. We, we got him, I got him pegged. So Brian, I worked for Brian. That, that was transformational in terms of uh, a pivot moment in my life, 
right? I, I, I saw something I loved doing, uh, had a passion for it, and he was responsible, one of my mentors, uh, Brian. Uh, the other guy I met there was this guy. Um, so Clee was a visitor, so he started out at the University of Michigan, came to New Mexico and, and visited Argonne. We were working on a project, and I'll get to that in a moment, uh, but he, he also was one of my mentors, and again, had a, um, uh, you know, a transformational impact on my, on my life in terms of software. I, I met him, I, I was told to help him when he visited Argonne, so I was like his gopher, if you will, and I, um, I, I, I was trying, I, I was told to show him how to use the computer system at Argonne, it was an interactive system, and it took me about five minutes and he got it, and then he was showing me things uh, to do on that, on that computer system. And I also met up with this guy on, at, at Argonne. So Bob, Bob Viroff was also, one of the students on this undergraduate program, not the same one that I was on, but he was a few years later, and uh, worked with uh, people uh, at Argonne doing things unrelated to what I was working on, but, but we were close friends and ended up as roommates for, for a short period of time. So that's, uh, that's my story of uh, uh, my history, so to speak. Uh, in, when I started computing, this is the uh, supercomputers of the day. So uh, the CDC 7600 with a 27 and a half nanosecond clock ty cycle time and the IBM 375. We had an IBM 375 at Argonne. So that's where I cut my teeth in terms of uh, computing. The CDC system had 64 kilowords of memory. So that was the total amount of memory on this machine. Uh, Seymour Cray was the designer. It had a peak performance of 36 megaflops. What, what, was, the, what was the performance on your, your four gigaflops? I think it's six gigaflops. So, so we see how times have changed. And it broke down at least once a day. And maybe more times. It was maybe four times a day. This was at uh, Los Alamos or San, uh, Livermore, I think. And uh, the IBM machine had a high degree of parallelism. Again, single processor. It, had, it operated about seven, seven instructions at one time. It had uh, four megabytes of memory on it. And both machines had a high degree of instruction level parallelism that, they, uh, that they were, was built into the hardware. So you didn't have to do anything. You got it automatically uh, through the code and through the uh, execution of that code on these machines. We were designing software for these computers, matrix software. And uh, this book um, by Wilkinson and Reinch. So Jim Wilkinson um, uh, received the Turing Award in 1970 for his contributions to rounding error analysis and, and the concept of backward error analysis, uh, backward error. And he actually worked with Alan Turing. So he, he helped build a machine called the Pilot Ace at the National Physical Laboratory, as, as Wilkinson would say. And uh, they, they worked together on that machine. And uh, Jim, uh, Will, uh, Turing moved on to other things. Uh, to, to work on, but uh, he did work with that. So this book here had the state of the art for eigenvalue problems, AX equal lambda X, and our, our job at Argonne National Lab was to take that and translate it into Fortran. So it was a translation process uh, that, we, that we were using, translating the Algol into Fortran, and uh, trying to make the code portable. Portable in the sense that the machines that we had at the time all had different uh, arithmetic uh, uh, word sizes. So you saw something about a 60-bit word size for the CDC machine, the IBM had 64 bits, and, and you know, it was very complicated to do numerical computations in a portable way when you moved code from one machine to another. And that was trying to be built into this into the software, the IcePack software. So that IcePack software had Brian Smith as the lead on it, a bunch of other people, uh, Cleve Moeller was, was involved in the project, and we, uh, we developed the software through this translation process. We were doing translation. If you know something about Algol, it stores the matrix elements by row, not by column. If you know something about Fortran, it stores things by column. So there's a fundamental difference in how we access data. Data access is the big deal in terms of performance. So the codes that are in IcePack really perform terrible. But it's the state of the art algorithms that are there that were used. In the 70s and 80s, we had vector computers. So Seymour Cray designed the Cray 1 system. And over at the Control Data Corporation, they had a machine called the Star 100. The Cray 1 had an 80 megahertz cycle time. It had one mega word of memory. And it had a peak performance of 120 megaflops. And it had vector registers. So it was doing vector instructions with vector registers. Think of the vector registers as a cache that can be used to keep information. So you didn't have to pay the expense of going from memory to the, to the processor unit every time. It could be cached in these vector registers. The CDC star system was also a vector machine, vector instructions. And those vector instructions uh, were not cached. They didn't have vector registers. The data had to be streamed from memory 
to the processor and then back out to memory before the next operation was performed. So it had an inherent limitation in terms of data bandwidth on the machine. It had a 25, a 40 nanosecond cycle time and one mega word of uh, memory as well. It had a peak performance of 100 megaflops, but that was, that 100 megaflops was uh, downgraded because of the data trans, the, tra the, the latency associated with moving data uh, from memory and the lack of reuse of that data. So the ice pack routines were there. We were in the midst, the community was in the midst of developing something called the level one blahs. Level one blahs are vector operations. So the idea was to create a set of fundamental operations that are vector in nature, and then those vector operations can be used in the library software that we're building. The vector operations were then, the intent was that they would be implemented very efficiently on the machines that were coming up. So the vendors were then re responsible for doing those level one BLAS operations. So the ideas in this uh, ice pack collection, the ideas were put into a set of software, the, the concepts that were used to develop ice pack were put into uh, a, a set of software called LinPack for solving systems of linear equations. That's eigenvalues. We're developing a package now for systems of linear equations, least squares, and singular value decomposition, but dealing with the operations in the Fortran centric way by column. And we had a set of uh, primitives that were column primitives. So we thought we had the perfect match of, uh, of software modules that would allow us to implement that uh, library very efficiently. So this is the, this is the LinPack group. This is the uh, guys from, uh, from, uh, from uh, this is Jim Bunch from the University of San, San Diego. There's a tie here to Bob Viroff. Bob Viroff was a student working with Jim Bunch. Uh, the, this is Pete Stewart, who is a professor at the University of Maryland. This is Cleve Moeller. And this is a 1979 version of me with a little bit more hair. And, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is my car. So this is the, the Limpac license plate, which was my car, New Mexico. I was a student in New Mexico. I got that license plate, put it on my car, and uh, this picture was taken at, uh, at one of the suburbs of uh, Chicago during one of the summer meetings where we would work on the Limpac collection. So in the appendix to the Limpac user's guide, I put together a table. And that table uh, was to give a, give a show the performance of using the LinPack software. So the idea was we would solve a system of equations, look at the performance, translate it into a rate of execution, and then give some formulas that would allow somebody to extrapolate. So if you solved a bigger problem, it would take a lot longer, and there were formulas to help based on the time it would take. So this table appeared in the appendix to that user's guide. This table contains uh, 23 machines, uh, it gives the time to solve a system of linear equations on a set of machines. Here's the set of machines. The fastest one is the NCAR. It was a Cray-1 system at, um, at, at NCAR, at National Center for Atmospheric Research. And the scribble down here is my notation of the performance that that machine received. So there's a time to solution and then a translation into rate of execution. The rate of execution is going to be an important thing for measuring uh, how machines compare to each other. So the NCAR machine did it at 14 megaflops. So 14 megaflops was the rate for solving a system of equations of order 100 using the LinPack software on that Cray-1 system. And you can see the, the differences with the, other, with the other ones. In the 90s, the machines changed again. We had vector machines now. We, they were translating to cache-based machines, which had shared memory parallel processing. So that was the next architectural change that took place. You know, there was a, there was a memory hierarchy associated with things. There were processors, and those processors shared main memory. So there's a uniform address space which can be accessed through the program, allowed the information to be cached and shared uh, through that mechanism there. There were a number of companies that invested in developing hardware that implemented this architecture. Multiflow, Alliant, Convex, Kendall Square, Sequent are, are just a few of the companies that, uh, that, that implemented architectures. All of those companies had a, had a, had a, had a brief burst of, of interest and of course, the interest died down and they all collapsed. All those companies went away uh, within, a, within a five or 10 year period of time. So we decided that um, we, we didn't have the right model of computation, vector operations. We wanted to raise the granularity. So we got the community together 
to develop another higher level of operations. Not vector operations, but looking now at matrix vector and matrix matrix kinds of operations. So those are things that are referred to as the level two and the level three blahs. They had community input. They, they had input, they were vetted in terms of the syntax, the semantics, what they should uh, feel like, look like, uh, what the calling sequence was, and uh, ultimately emerged the set of routines that could be used. The idea was to raise the level of granularity, get much better reuse of cash on those machines that were available at the time, and allow for some parallel processing, some kind of shared memory parallel processing that would be encapsulated in those routines. So that was the goal. So we were gonna take the concepts and ideas of the software that was developed in IcePack, plus the ideas that were developed in LinPack and develop a new package. And that package uh, with these refactoring of algorithms using block-based systems is called LAPack. So LAPack emerged by taking eigenvalues and systems of equations, putting them into, a, into another package and developing that based on these level two and level three BLAS operations. So here's the happy group that uh, were involved in that operation. Uh, this is um, Sven Hammerling, Zhao Jingbai, Ann Greenbaum, Ed Anderson, uh, Alan McKinney. McKinney. Uh, this is uh, Jeremy DeCrow, Jim Demmel, who is uh, the co-architect of this. And this is a, this is a 19, uh, I guess, uh, 89 version of me uh, uh, it, with my car. And that's my license plate, which says LAPAC. Of course. Um, so as times went on, the architectures continued to change. Now we have machines which have distributed memory. So there's no, there's no centralized memory. There's no way in which to access it through a shared memory paradigm. We now have to engage in something to send information from one process to another, where each process had their own local set of memory to, to, to use in the computations. Again, a number of companies were developed to exploit this architecture, BBN, Murinet, Thinking Machines, uh, Mako, uh, N-Cubed. They all had architectures that exploited this kind of thing. Those machines also had a brief uh, flurry of uh, interest, uh, built machines, and then quickly uh, went away and uh, went out of business. So it was an exciting time, though, to be involved in parallel computing. There was a lot of machines to experiment with, a lot of ideas to test out, a lot of things to experiment with. And message passing was in the air. So we knew about message passing, we knew it was important, but there was no standard for it. Every group seemed to have their own way of doing message passing. At Argonne, they had something called P4. In the mountains of Tennessee, we had something called PVM. Intel had a way of doing it. The guys at Caltech, IBM, each had their own way of doing message passing. And we couldn't develop a standard set of software that we could take from one architecture, one machine to another machine. We had to develop a standard. And that's where this MPI interface comes in, sorry, the message passing interface comes in. So I got together with colleagues around the world to develop uh, this standard for doing message passing. It was sort of a heroic effort in some sense. We met every six weeks at a hotel in da outside, of, uh, outside the Dallas Fort Worth Airport for three days over a period of a year and a half. And after that year and a half, we had the standard. It emerged, that standard was quickly embraced by the community, and we had a versions that were running on different machines, and that now is the way in which we do parallel processing on our scientific uh, computers. So the idea then was to take those algorithms, concepts, and ideas in LAPAC and that, were, that was used mainly for shared memory systems and cache-based systems and move that over using MPI to develop a layer, uh, using the MPI layer to develop a set of routines that had distributed memory and that was a package that we called ScalaPack. So the, all those concepts and ideas went into the ScalaPack package for solving eigenvalue problems and systems of linear equations. That software was developed and made available to the community. And that's the software that's in use to the most part uh, today. In the, more recently, in the 2010s, uh, we had the architectures changing again, and the architectures changed to, gi to give us, uh, uh, us multi-core uh, uh, as well as GPU architectures. So we had architectural changes that were boosting the performance by the use of these uh, accelerators. And um, uh, we were experimenting with things to develop, again, software libraries that exploited that, those many core that, that were available as well as the uh, GPUs. And those projects go by the name of Plasma and Magma. Think of those as research projects developing software that can effectively use that kind of, uh, that, that kind of architecture. 
We have machines now which have over 10,000 processes, and we have to understand how we can effectively manage the use of that number, that level of parallel processing. In the past, we did simple loop level, do all kind of parallelism, where we would fork and join, fork and join. When you have 10,000 processors, you can't use that level of parallelism. It just is, is too much for the, for the levels of parallelism. That bulk synchronous processing really halts any kind of performance that you would expect uh, from using that level of performance. So we had to exploit other tricks in our computer science bag uh, to effectively do that. And we used a directed acyclic a graph approach. So we're going to express the algorithms not in terms of loops that can be done in parallel, but in terms of a directed acyclic graph. And then trying to find the, the uh, critical path in that, uh, that DAG, execute that critical path, and that'll release the, the maximum amount of parallelism uh, for us to exploit in our architectures. So that was, an ar that, that was a design that was implemented. Um, but we also had a situation where machine learning was starting to creep in, and we understood that with machine learning, it's important to be able to do small problems, but lots of them, in an embarrassingly parallel way. So we don't want to have a loop around, let's say, a matrix multiply call. We want to make one call to matrix multiply and have it instantiated across thousands of, of examples of matrix multiply. So we can shorten the period and encapsulate the parallel processing to exploit the hardware that's under Underneath. And that's true of other higher level operations like doing a batched version of the singular value decomposition and trying to do it in exactly that same way. So, um, uh, so we, have, uh, we have a number of things going on. We had a, uh, 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 an interface that allowed us to do directed acyclic graphs and we had the standard for doing these batch kind of operations. Well, more recently, uh, we have uh, architectures evolving yet again. CPUs and GPUs are being exploited at a much higher level. Uh, we have many, many cores and many, many GPUs on a node. An example of that is the uh, Oak Ridge Summit supercomputer. This is a machine that was put into operation in 2018, has 200 petaflops peak performance, has 10 megawatts of power. It uses, uh, on each node, it exploits two IBM Power9 processors with 22 cores plus six NVIDIA GPUs. That's one node, and of course that node gets replicated uh, uh, 4,600 times uh, to build out a machine that's about the size of two tennis courts. So that's the architecture that we were targeting um, uh, more recently uh, for our software. But the interesting thing here is that we have a machine which is GPU based. So it's effectively getting its performance, roughly 98% of the performance is coming from the GPUs. So you had better be using those GPUs. The CPUs are providing very little performance. So you had better be exploiting that in order to get anywhere near the peak performance that this machine is capable of 200 uh, petaflops. So we were trying to exploit that within our architectures. And that brings us really to the most recent uh, software development called Slate. So Slate is intending to take all of those ideas for systems of linear equations and eigenvalue problems, put them in, putting them around a, a DAG-based approach using uh, as much as possible uh, the GPUs to do the scheduling of the, uh, of the operations across those things in a way that's portable and transparent to the user. So the user's not aware of it. He makes a call to a routine, linear algebra routine, and everything happens under the covers, so to speak, so the user doesn't have to get involved with the details of the underlying architecture. So the idea is to develop software that, it, that goes through this pyramid, from the highest uh, supercomputer centers to regional centers to even down to your laptops. The software should run with minor minor uh, user interference in terms of the library software itself. They just instantiate the library software on the machine and it works. And it has these attributes, and these are the attributes that we've developed in our, in our packages. It has accuracy, it has a community involvement in terms of getting things there, it has state-of-the-art algorithms, it tries to exploit performance whenever it can, it, it's developed in a portable way, it's trying to make the user more productive. Uh, codes are intended to be readable in the sense that a user should be able to pick it up and try to figure out what's going on in terms of the, in terms of the structure and reliability should be there in terms of the performance that, that one sees, numerical performance that one sees. So the environment that we have today is distributed memory, 
Highly parallel using MPI and OpenMP as the programming paradigms. The example architecture is Frontier. It's two exaflops as the theoretical peak performance, and that's for 64-bit operations. It has 8 million cores on this machine. 9,000 nodes, 30 megawatts. So what's a megawatt? So I usually uh, tell people that um, if you use a megawatt for one year at your house, you're gonna get a bill from the electric company for $1 million. So a megawatt year is a million dollars. So this machine to turn it on is about $30 million just to turn the machine on. And the performance for this machine is based on the processors. It's AMD processors in terms of multi-core and it also has AMD GPUs and 98% of the performance is coming from the GPUs. So you had better be using those GPUs or you're really not gonna be using this machine up to its potential. The, the architectures are heterogeneous, CPUs and GPUs, but notice that we're using commodity parts. So this is part of the story in some sense. All of, our, all of the scientific machines are based on commodity parts, commodity processors, commodity GPUs, commodity interconnect, commodity operating system. So that's gonna be an issue, I'll say, in, for the future. Today, uh, we can't use simple loops. We have to go to some other structure, higher levels like uh, directed acyclic graphs. Communication is very expensive on these machines. So um, you had better be trying to minimize the amount of communication you do to memory or the communication you do to processors in order to extract the performance that we get on the architectures. So a comparison of operations today is not really a reflection of the time to solution. So you know the old, uh, the old uh, anecdote or, or uh, 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 our, our idea of how, uh, how algorithms operate is you look at the number of operations from algorithm one, if you have another algorithm that does the same thing, algorithm two, and it has more operations, we would say we want the one with less operations. But that's not true in today's world because of the communication price. So we wanna have algorithms which have low communication in order to get the best performance. And the other thing we have to be aware of is that the architectures the floating point architectures that we have really come in different flavors, 64-bit, 32-bit uh, is common, that's been around for a long time, but uh, the machine learning community wants even less precision, so they can get by with 16-bit floating point. When you use 16-bit floating point, you get very high performance rates, so now the idea is to try to structure things so you can maybe leverage that 16-bit floating point for part of your computation, and then finish up maybe with the 64-bit. And even architectures today have 8-bit uh, have floating point arithmetic that can be exploited. I haven't really found the opportunity to use 8-bit floating point arithmetic, uh, but the machine learning is driving things in that direction. Okay, I've, uh, I became an accidental, accidental tourist, uh, accidental benchmarker uh, back in uh, 1978 with the LINPAC benchmark. Uh, Hans Moyer, who's pictured here on the right, um, uh, was a professor at Mannheim University and he had a list of the fastest computers by peak performance. So Hans said that maybe we should merge our lists. I had this list of over a thousand machines running the LINPAC benchmark. Hans had a list of uh, high performance machines. He said, let's merge our lists and let's call it the top 500. And that's how that was born. And the, the idea is to solve a system of linear equations, AX equal B. The ground rules are use Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. That's, you must use that algorithm. Um, you can use any implementation you want of that algorithm, solve a system of linear equations as large as possible, and we're gonna look at the rate of execution. So that's, that's what gets entered into this uh, table is, the, is your rate of execution for solving that problem. 64-bit floating point arithmetic, you gotta get the right answer. We do a check of that. Uh, and that list comes out twice a year in November and also in, in June. So this is a snapshot, if you will, of high performance computing uh, going back to when we started uh, uh, 29 years ago, uh, this list. So the red dots are giving us the machine number one. So the fastest computer today is 1.1 exaflops. The guy at position uh, number 500 is here, 165 petaflops. That's the guy that just made it on the list. So maybe to be called a supercomputer, you have to fit somewhere in that bracket. And the blue thing is the sum of the 500 machines. So that's an Excel sheet computation, um, uh, just adding up the numbers. So a number of interesting things. So we got this, uh, the trend line sort of, sort of separate, uh, don't quite make sense past 2008. So what's going on there? You know, why is there that, uh, that, that difference? Um, uh, you know, it could be because of uh, Moore's Law slowing down. Bernard scaling uh, is a thing which ended in 2007. There was an economic crisis that occurred about that point, so machines were not being replaced at the same rate, and maybe it's a combination of all of those, all of those things. 
Okay, so it's interesting. Los Alamos had the number one machine when this list first came out. It was a, it was a thinking machine, CM5, with 1,000 processors, and it had uh, 60 gigaflops was its theoretical uh, peak, was its actual performance for solving a system of linear equations. So the laptop that I use, that I have in my bag here, I can run the benchmark on it, and I get 426 gigaflops out of my laptop. That's, that's stunning. This is a machine I use to read email, and I'm getting 426 gigaflops out of my laptop. You know, that would have been on the top 500 list. It would have been, uh, you know, in 1997. Uh, the, the number one machine in 1997 uh, was a Hitachi uh, machine with 2,000 processors used in SCUBA for doing their uh, high performance computing. So incredible changes over a very short period of time. So this is the top 10 list today from the top 500. Uh, this is the number one computer. Uh, it's at Oak Ridge, it's Frontier, it's, it's integrated by HPE, it uses a Cray interconnect, it has AMD processors, and it uses a GPU from AMD. The red things indicate GPUs. So if you just scan down the list here, nine of the ten machines use GPUs to accelerate performance. This machine has 7.7 .7 million cores. It got 1.1 exaflops in terms of its uh, performance on LinPack, and that's 55% of the theoretical peak performance. This computation is matrix multiply, and the matrix multiply can be done very efficiently on these GPUs, and they're only getting 55% of the theoretical peak. So there's something wrong here with the architecture or how things are implemented. It uses 21 megawatts under load, and that gives you an efficiency of 52 gigaflops per watt. So you just look down this list here. The US has five machines on the list. Um, uh, those machines are, are all at, uh, not, not quite all, four of the five are at uh, DOE Labs. There's a machine at NVIDIA, which is in-house. And uh, China has a couple of machines. Uh, Finland, Japan, and uh, France sort of round out uh, this list of uh, machines. So um, you know these machines are running at an exaflop. So what's an exaflop? Exaflop, okay, so we're talking about adds, and multi adds or multiplies of 64-bit uh, operands. So that's, that's the first thing we're doing. So an exaflop is a billion, billion floating point operations, 10 to the 18 operations. I have a hard time getting my hands around this. I was in France uh, about a month ago, and I, gave a, I showed this slide, and I, I, I said I got an interview afterwards, and I told the interview guy for the news, local newspaper, a billion, billion floating point operations. And when the newspaper article came out, the next day it said two billion. <laughs> this, is, this is not two billion, it's a billion, billion operations. So get that, make sure you have that in, in your focus. So, um, you know, so think of it like this. If each person on Earth did one calculation per second, each person on Earth, it would take four years to do an exaflop. Four years. So that's, the, that's what we can do in one second on this computer. So, you know, a stunning amount of uh, floating point operations. China. China is interested in high performance computing. I don't know if you read the newspaper, um, you know, China's uh, making, making progress here. So China has uh, 173 supercomputers. Yeah, in, in their country. So 173 of the 500. U.S. has 128, and then you see the others. China's the top producer of supercomputers, so they make the most supercomputers. They're made by Lenovo, Sugan, Inspur, Huawei, and uh, NUDT. So, uh, you know, again, take a look at the newspapers. There's some action going on here. There's the U.S. government's imposing restrictions on what's going on with um, Taiwan. So, uh, China has two exaflop computers, the rumor to have two exaflop computers. They, they've written scientific papers about these machines. We know about their architectures. We know what's going on at a very deep level inside the machines. There's rumors that they have uh, LINPAC numbers, but they haven't submitted it. So in order to get on the, the top 500 list, you have to submit your results. Submit it to us, we, we vet it, make sure that you got the right answer, enter your numbers into the table, and then you're done. They haven't submitted it. So why haven't they submitted it? That's the question. Why haven't they submitted it? It's my, 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 my assumption is that um, uh, the chips that they're, they're using inside their machines, uh, while they're designed in China, uh, they're, they're fabricated outside. They're fabricated in Taiwan. And uh, the US may take some action against Taiwan to prevent them, and the Chinese are concerned. In the US, we have a, the Department of Energy Exascale Computing Program. So it's $4 billion is what the Department of Energy is spending over seven years. That's the program that's in place. We're in the last year of that program right now. 
So what do you get for $4 billion? Well, you get three computers, <laughs> right? So these computers are 300, 300 million each. So there's a computer at, uh, at Argonne that's about to go in place. There's a machine at Oak Ridge, which is operational today. And there's a machine at Livermore that's gonna be there. Each one on the order of $600 million. And then there's something called non-reoccurring engineering. So this is, this is 400 million paid to vendors to modify their architectures just a little bit to do scientific computing problems, just a little bit. If you told me where, are, where, where changes they make, I couldn't point to it. Somebody may be able to, I can't point to it. Uh, but that's, that's what's happening with scientific computing. And then you get 21 applications. So these are applications that are of interest to the Department of Energy. This is the whole reason for the program is to do the applications. The technology is there just to help the applications do their thing. And there's a software stack that's in place to, to do this as well. So there's 84, 84 software projects uh, that are being used uh, around, the, uh, around the DOE complex. About 1,000 researchers are involved in this project. And this project will end in uh, one year. And there's no follow-on, right? So uh, I don't know what's gonna happen to those 1,000 people. They don't have any, any guarantee of any kind of work. And it's leading me to be very concerned in terms of the, um, uh, you know, the DOE community and all of the, in, all of the uh, resource, all of the intelligence that they've built up, the knowledge they've built up over the years may be drained off. And these are very, very talented uh, people. Okay, if we look at performance over time, and uh, so I've got chips laid out here. So this is, we're looking at chips over a period of from, from 1975 until today. And we're looking at, uh, uh, on the y-axis is the floating point execution rate divided by the number of words you can transfer from memory, right? You want this number uh, to be as small as possible. So in the old days, we had machines that were below one in this list. So basically think of one floating point operation for every word that you can transfer from memory. So you want that, that number to be, uh, a Cray, Cray 1 system had that uh, number pegged at two. two uh, it did two floating point operations for every three words that could be transferred from memory. And that was ideal. That was a really great situation back in the old days. Today we don't have that situation. We see this, uh, we see things change over time Things become more expensive to transfer memory. The floating point units uh, have more capability in terms of floating point operations. And today we have on the order of 200 floating point operations for every word that you can transfer from memory. So again, that says unless you can get reuse of that data, unless you can effectively uh, uh, do those operations over and over again on, those, on, that, on that information, you're going to have very poor performance in terms of that. So the LINPAC benchmark's been around for a long time. It started in 1979. It has some very positive features. It's easy to understand. It's easy to run. It's easy to show these trends that occur over time. However, you know, a lot's changed since 1979. The architectures have changed. And this thing here does matrix multiply at its core. And this may not be a really good reflection of the applications that we have today. In the old days, floating point was very expensive. Today, it's not expensive. Data movement's very expensive. This benchmark does not do a very good job of exposing poor architectures for data movement. So, uh, you know, the, the, the things that were, were good about LINPAC are no longer correlated with real applications that are, that are in process today. So the LINPAC benchmark, again, does dense matrix multiply. Uh, you know, maybe we need to rethink and redesign something uh, for the applications that we have today. So if you take a look at what's done on, on our, our high performance machines today, we're doing simulations. And there's a list of applications that we have here. And if you take a look at that list, ultimately what's happening is they're solving a three-dimensional partial differential equation. And that 3D PDE is going to be solved. There's a system of equations that, that arises from that through the discretization process. And we have to solve, again, a system of linear equations, but it's not dense. It's sparse. There's a sparse matrix problem that we need to have. And dense computations, or the algorithm that's in LINPAC, is not a good measure of this. So we have to get, you think about doing an iterative process. So the iterative process that we have is something called HPCG. So this is some work done with Mike Carew out here at Sandia and my uh, colleague Piotr Luszczak at the University of Tennessee. So we have a benchmark that looks at conjugate gradients as the basic algorithm. We're going to solve a system of equations again. It's sparse. The sparsity comes about by doing a uh, three-dimensional uh, by, by looking at a three-dimensional problem, uh, looking at a 27-point stencil, looking at the matrix that results in it. This is sort of the form of the matrix. And then employing a preconditioner on top of that to accelerate the, uh, the convergence. 
And uh, this, is a, this is a ranking, if you will, uh, for this benchmark. So, um, so what's the number one machine? It's the Japanese machine, the Fugaku system. The Fugaku system was the only machine on that top 10 list before that did not use accelerators. It has vector instructions. And it's designed to do scientific computations. That's how the designers worked very hard along with computational scientists to understand what's, what's important. And they have a machine here which does pretty good. Uh, the, Lin, the LINPAC number uh, for this machine is, is, uh, is listed here. The HPC gene number is listed here. So notice that we have 442, and, and for, the, for the iterative benchmark, we're getting 16, we're getting 16 petaflops. So that says we're getting 3% of the theoretical peak performance for this machine, 3% of the theoretical peak. And if you scan down this list, you even see machines which are, um, are even uh, more of an issue. So here's a machine in Finland. That machine looks a lot like the machine at Oak Ridge, the Frontier system. It's a miniature version of it. Frontier didn't have enough time to run the benchmark. So we don't have a number for Frontier. But, but look at what we have here. We have something which is uh, which is 0.9% of the theoretical peak, less than 1% of the theoretical peak for a problem that comes up over and over again in terms of uh, the solving of three-dimensional partial differential equations. Think of a race car going 200 miles per hour, that's the theoretical speed limit, and now you're getting two miles per hour. Would you be happy with that race car? Probably not. Okay, so um, I'm coming to the conclusion here. I'm finishing within my 10, <laughs> within my 10 minute window. Uh, so, um, so here's the takeaway. The hardware's uh, changing. It's changed quite a bit. Uh, we had scalar, we went to vector, to distributed memory, to accelerated. We have some machine precision thrown in. And um, you know, um, we have a situation where the hardware designers are designing hardware that have very high ex potential execution rates. They design a machine and they throw it over the fence at the scientific community. And now the scientific community has to scramble to figure out how to use this machine to solve their problems. So they, they scramble, they figure it out. After five years of a machine being in existence, they get it right almost. And then the next machine is thrown over the fence and we have to start, we have to start again. That's sort of the process we have. We'd like to think about co-design where the uh, architects get together with the um, get together with the computational scientists, get together with the software developers and the algorithm people, and design a machine that makes sense uh, for, for those applications that it's intended for, that it's gonna be run on. But today we don't have that. Okay, so we have three computer revolutions, high performance computing is what I talked about. You know, machine learning, deep learning is, a, is, is really a big deal. That, that's, that's gonna make a tremendous impact. Um, uh, it's one of the tools that, that are gonna be used to help us in solving problems. It's not gonna be used to solve the problem, it's gonna help us solve the problems. And I didn't get to talk about AI or things related to it. So algorithms and software follow the hardware that's been developed. Uh, and uh, you know, when these hardware machines come out, there's plenty of room at the top for improvement. It's just a matter of how much effort you wanna spend on getting there. So um, it's a riff. There was a paper published uh, a couple years ago in Science uh, by Charles Leiserson and company, and uh, the paper was about there's plenty of room at the top, uh, what will drive computer performance after Moore's Law, and it talks about many of the issues that I've just raised. It's a riff on Feynman's uh, lecture about there's plenty of room on the bottom, really talking about uh, quantum computing at, at some fundamental level, and um, uh, I, I would recommend uh, reading that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. You know, I've got a lot of people to thank, and this is a list <laughs> of some of them. <laughs> So we're gonna have a Q and A session, and uh, I promised, you know, <coughs> Jack, that he will only answer today. He should only answer good questions. Good questions. <laughs> yeah. so, I'll, I'll give you the, the bad questions. That's okay. right. So uh, we do have some questions that we're gonna take from the audience here, but we also have some questions from folks uh, online, so we'll see, we'll start with you here, folks. So first of all, I uh, would like to thank you. Uh, it may take some of us hundreds of years <laughs> to get somebody else from UNM, <laughs> graduating from UNM, getting a touring award and coming a lecture. So this is, good luck. So it may never happen in our lifetime again. 
Okay. So thank you. So we're all very lucky today. So questions? Good questions. Who wants to try? See, everybody's afraid. No, no, no. We, got, we have a question back here. Isn't Deep back. So I'm going to start, Jack, with the esoteric questions. Like in the 70s and 80s, there was a language IBM had designed, a programming language. APL, yes. APL. How come you guys never thought about using that for Work. Well, okay, so that's interesting. So my, one of the first languages I, I programmed on was APL. I, I used APL on a time-sharing system uh, when I was an undergraduate. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a language with a very high level of uh, expressiveness, high level of granularity. I very well remember the domino symbol. Domino symbol was the matrix inversion symbol. Um, uh, but this guy here has, a, has another idea about, about uh, APL. Uh, his his uh, creation, uh, in some senses, um, uh, may, may, uh, may, uh, may go beyond APL, at least from, from the kind of work that I'm, I'm accustomed to or familiar with. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to APL. I guess it just faded away. Nobody ever does it again. But historically, it's an interesting, interesting language. Um, uh, we, you know, we do have languages that uh, are at a higher level of granularity. Uh, Math, Math Lab is, is certainly an example of that. Uh, you know, we have other things. You know, we can talk about Math, Mathematica, R, Julia, uh, other things as well. But you know, MATLAB is, is the one I learned as I was growing up. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Patrick. I'll, I'll follow up on Deepak's question. What should we be teaching students to do parallel programming in today? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Presumably not, presumably not APL. Not APL, that's right. So and not APL. Uh, yeah, I have a hard time struggle with this as well. So um, you know, what, what language should we be using? Uh, we want a high level language, I guess, to get them exposed to it. Uh, but at some level, we should teach them about the details of what's going on underneath. Uh, you know, for my students, they have to learn uh, C++, uh, MPI, uh, OpenMP. Those are things that they would learn in a course, but th that's, that's, at a, that's at a higher level. We're talking about what, what should an undergraduate learn uh, as, as an introduction to computing. It should be parallel, of course. Everything is parallel. That's the first, that's the first thing there. I, I don't have a good answer to that. So let me ask you as a, as a, as a professor of somebody, as a professor here, what do you teach? I mean, I don't have a... <laughs> I, mean, I think it's a good question. We we do the C C C plus plus MPI, yeah. you know, Cocos Open MP things you do. I mean Python is a good place to Python. start. Finding the right parallel structures there is always a challenge. Yeah. And Python's not the best on that. Julia's sort of promising that. I mean we're struggling with the same question. Yeah. Which is why I was interested what you're uh, yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry I don't have anything to, to move the ball forward on that. Cleve, Cleve does, though. Wait a second. Here's Cleve. <laughs> Is it, do you want to teach, teach how to do parallel computing? Do you want to teach how to do parallel computing? Or do you want to use parallel computing? Well, those are two different questions. That's very, right. very different things. Yeah. MATLAB isn't really good for it. I can't recommend MATLAB because the parallelism is all hidden there. If you want to teach how parallelism works, MATLAB isn't the place. Arash? That was the same question. I have the same question. Okay. You described the trajectory of, of different architectures. Obviously, you mentioned quantum computing. What? If you take all of this, this sweep of of, of your work, what do you perceive as the, the, the things to look for in terms, of, in terms of what's next, in terms of supercomputing, in terms of architectures combining, you know, you have CPUs plus GPUs, or you have three of them all together, and, and, and what's going to be the rate limiting step uh, uh, for, you know? For computation, for yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. I just want to, I want to go back to the, uh, I, I sort of alluded to it. Uh, we use commodity parts. So everything that's used in the scientific community uh, for building machines, commodity processors, commodity interconnects, uh, commodity operating systems. Um, uh, so um, those, those parts were not designed to do scientific computing. That, that the sold, you know, they're, they're not a scientific part. And um, uh, we use them because they're cheap. That, that's the real reason why they're, they're in our supercomputers, because we can leverage all of that, all of those components, and get relatively high peak performance in terms of our processors. When you take a look at what's happening with other, other areas in computing, take a look at uh, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Google, uh, even uh, companies like, uh, 
um, well, Tesla. So they, they, they've got their own processors. These guys are investing in developing hardware to satisfy their needs. These companies are exothermic. They have tremendous amounts of research, resources at their disposal, tremendous amount of money that they can invest in developing hardware to solve their problem. In the scientific uh, community, we're endothermic. We don't have enough funds. You know, it's, it's a struggle for us to get the right funding level to put in place programs to develop parts that are really uh, specifically designed to solve our problems. So maybe we should start thinking about uh, design, it, it, getting into a situation where we can design hardware to solve our problem. And uh, you know, there's some promising hope. So you know, chiplets is a way to develop uh, components that go on a chip that are specialized for the needs that you have. So we might think about a chiplet to do FFTs or another chiplet to do a singular value decomposition. If those are important things, put that on the chip itself. And it's, it'll, it'll, it's gonna become easier as the components standardize to do that interface and to get high performance out of it and to develop those components that actually would go onto a chip. So maybe that's a path forward for us. But I think the, the Department of Energy Laboratories who invest so much money in terms of the uh, machines uh, they're not really getting what they pay for in terms of the return uh, of performance. And machines designed for problems that, that they really want to solve. So maybe it's time for the DOE labs to really start up programs which look at hardware design and implementing uh, hardware for their problems themselves. So I think you know, that's, that may be a way forward, uh, at least a startup for DOE. That's what we're pitching. Yes. So I have two questions, yes. one of which is good and one of which is not. Okay, you talk to him. <laughs> the, good question, the, the, the good question is actually related to what you were just saying, and that is I was really struck by the, the energy use data you showed. And so we build supercomputers with cheap parts so the capital cost will sort of be minimized, and then we really pay for on it. On the back end. On the back end. And so is anyone looking at optimizing that balance? Right, so, um, uh, so we haven't started to do it in, in large part. People are always concerned about that, that issue. Uh, but I would say it's more of an issue in Europe, uh, Europe and Japan, where energy costs are much higher than they are here. So they're looking very seriously, and they may not be able to get to exascale or get beyond exascale because of that. That is, they're, they're really going to be limited in terms of, of, of the power consumption and may, may have to turn to uh, be limited and, and just stay below that point forever. Um, uh, so you know, that, that's certainly one, one of the aspects there. Uh, and people are, are concerned about it. Uh, but you know, to be honest, I have to say, when I look at the power consumptions of our data cent uh, the data centers that are run by Google, Facebook, Microsoft, they're, they're an order of magnitude greater than we're talking about here. And you know, no problem, exothermic, they've got plenty of resources to pay for it. And now the not so oh, good, good thank you. Uh, now I'll ask it to you too. Okay. Would it be correct to summarize your entire talk by saying that I wasted my time by running the Linux? <laughs> <laughs> well, I heated it up, so maybe not. It's a the cold day, it might be a good thing to do. That's right. <laughs> Any other questions uh, down there? Deepak. Okay, Deepak. So it's a two-part question, Jack. You said communication is a major bottleneck in this. So, so is there a replacement for MPI then? Uh, no, it's not MPI's problem. It's not MPI. MPI is just the, the messenger. <laughs> it's just the way, the, the way in which we, we communicate. But, so the real problem is how we, it's the algorithm itself. The algorithm is doing too much communication. And we can point to a number of places where that communication is really costing quite a bit. You know, at the lowest level, it's from memory into the processor. And then we can talk about from other processors into other processors' memory. All of that compounds the thing. We should be looking for algorithms which minimize the amount of communication. That's the strategy that some of us employ. Uh, with a linear algebra thing, you know, Jim Demmel's made, uh, made a cottage industry out of that, trying to minimize the amount of data and getting the algorithms that are provably the lowest amount of, uh, of data movement for that class of algorithms. And you know, that, that, that is, a, I think, a great uh, line of research. So second question yeah. is basically. Uh, uh, can you use the mic because the okay, second question now is uh, about uh, this uh, recent uh, development of uh, doing matrix multiplication using alpha zero. So, uh, right, so you're talking about, uh, there's a paper that appeared in Nature, I think, uh, last week. Uh, that talked about uh, getting the exponent down. Uh, so we know about Strassen's algorithm for matrix multiply. Strassen's algorithm is a log, a log base, uh, uh, so it's n to the two, uh, uh, I forget the, the thing. Okay, so, so we understand that Strassen is able to do it in a fewer, fewer number of operations 
and um, some asymptotically. So there were some guys in this Nature paper who looked at using AI to discover an algorithm that was better than Strassen's algorithm. And they discovered something which was, a, I think they, they saved one matrix, one matrix multiply, so they were able to get the rate a little bit lower. So that, that's a terrific theoretical result. It's a wonderful use of AI to help us understand, uh, explore a space to get algorithms. Uh, I think that that's a great thing. Uh, what the implications are of that in, in practical things, uh, you know, I'm not sure yet. I, I would say probably not. You know, we know about, you know, we've had, there's a whole, again, there's a cottage industry of people who are trying to minimize that exponent and have got it down to pretty low. You know, the, uh, theoretically, we would say it's, it's, it's um, uh, n, n squared is the limit uh, for, for doing this. It's, I don't think that'll happen in my lifetime. Uh, but, you know, the, the constant there is so large that it's, it's going to inhibit that being practical. So, you know, there, there, there are things there which limit it. But theoretical results, wonderful. I think the gentleman down there had a question right there. There's yes. Also one of the kids. Uh, so I'm a high school senior, and uh, I want to focus on, like, computer science in college. So computer science and software engineering. So what do you think I should, like, focus on right now? Oh, computer science. Uh, so you, you, should, you should do that. You should focus on computer science and engineering. That's a great idea. We're, we're all in favor of that. And uh, where, where are you thinking of going to school? Uh, North, North Carolina. You, you should have said New Mexico. You would have got a round of applause. And then we can move on to the other part of your question. Now, now you're finished. No, no. <laughs> so if you want to, so of course, study computer science and, uh, sorry, computer science and, so, and engineering. Those are great things to, to look at. A lot, lot of open things there, a lot of promise for the future. Uh, you know, AI and machine learning, that, that's like fire. That, that's something important. That's a tool that's going to be used from now on to help us solve problems, at least in scientific computing and in all fields, to be honest. That's going to, that's going to play a major role. So if, you have a, if you're thinking about which way to go, look at that and, oh, and uh, try to, uh, try to get, get exposed to that. But you may want to think about New Mexico <laughs> as well. <laughs> So how many more questions can you handle? We, I know you've been talking for a long time, so... Maybe you're tired of me talking. <laughs> <laughs> no. So we'll give you one more question. Okay, one more question. And then, then I, I have can... a question. I oh, you got one, one in your pocket. So, yes. Did you use the word co-designs? Uh, but then you characterize the hardware innovators throwing things over the fence and the software developers are having to take that. I think you partially answered this, but are there any optimistic signs that co-design is possible or will true what's going on better in the future? And I, I guess part of the question for me is, isn't it the case that GPUs were developed for gamers and video and basically um, high performance computing people are second class citizens when it comes to the marketplace? And isn't that what we can expect realistically? Uh, you said it better than I could. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, um, where, so where should we look? Am I optimistic? Um, the Japanese have done an excellent job with their Fugaku system. So it, it was designed to do scientific problems. And you know, they, they were able to get a bit more performance out of it. And it makes people more productive. That, that's ultimately what I would hope would happen, is by a co-design, these machines are easier to use. So they're, they make us more productive. We're, we're the important in this whole equation. We're the most. The, the equipment is not. That, that, that's something transient. That's something that's going to go away. That's something which costs. The cost. The, we, we cost more than the equipment in the end. You know, the group actually using the, the machine. Our time is, is the most valuable thing. So we want to have machines that could effectively um, uh, use that. Designing things from the ground up that can solve scientific problems is really the right way to go. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a deviation now from, from what, we're, what we've been doing for the last 40, 50 years using commodity parts. And again, we, we do that, as you said, uh, because we're, we're trying to uh, squeak out a low, low cost uh, solution to a problem where we should be uh, investing in trying to design our own thing up front. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you. Put money <laughs> <laughs> and I get a bowling ball? What is that? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a ball. Okay. Uh, no, it's a bowling ball. What is it? No, it's a, it's a, oh, wait, it's a beautiful vase. Oh, yes. it's beautiful. So, oh, I see it. Oh, my gosh. Um, That's terrific. Him, right? so, <laughs> um, I guess I did okay. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, I have one question. You can give this back to Thank me. Thank you so much. Uh, people told me to ask you this question. What do you think your legacy would be? I do know that most likely your legacy would be defined with this amazing award. But if you were to write your own legacy, oh my God. what would that be? My own legacy. Oh, wow. I've never been asked this question. My legacy. Uh, so, um, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, so the award was for uh, three things that I've done. Uh, the development of the mathematical software that we talked about, and I had a lot of help from many of the people uh, here uh, in doing that. That's one thing, so my legacy should be about the mathematical software. It should be about um, uh, the communication library that we developed. MPI was a, was a really thing which transformed and, and how, how things are done. It's the way we do scientific computing today. Can we do better? Of course we can. But it's something that was important and, and will be important for the near future. And then uh, the, being able to measure the performance of computers and make some evaluation on things, the uh, top 500 is an example of that. You know, it, it's something that uh, I have to live with, the, the LIMPAC benchmark I live with, uh, it's something which you know, plays, a, plays a part, but it shouldn't be focused on as the sole thing. We have other benchmarks that can do that. I always tell people you want to develop benchmarks that really reflect your application in some sense and do a good job of measuring things through your application's uh, uh, critical components. So those are the three things, if I had a legacy, uh, math software, communication, and um, the ability to uh, do some performance measurement. I, I, I sort of, uh, uh, I got started in all of this uh, you know, back with uh, uh, developing IcePack, LIMPAC. I look at these two guys here as really being uh, way, guys who showed me the way to do that. And um, uh, yeah, so those, those, are, those are good models. Yeah. Jack, you, you are our legacy. <laughs> Your legacy is <laughs> students. That's true. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to say that I have to hold up accidentally <laughs> uh, at the computer science building. It's the magazine with Jack's, you know, face here. He signed it, so I'm gonna start selling it. Put <laughs> <laughs> it on eBay. <laughs> on eBay, yeah. This is one of a kind, probably in New Mexico here. So signed. 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 So I do wanna, uh, on behalf of everyone here, we wanna thank you. Uh, great uh, talk, and uh, I do wanna mention one more thing, since today we have uh, <coughs> Clev here with us is that MathWorks has donated $2 million to Oops. the School of Engineering. Wow. Uh, and of course, the provost added some more money. So thank you to bring a, an endowed professor who's going to continue that work that Clev started here for many, 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 many more years. We're all going to be gone, at least some of us. <laughs> <laughs> but this work will continue. So maybe, maybe we'll produce somebody else who can win the Turing Award, you know, so we're not sure, but thank you, thank you.